Good evening, everybody. It's Saturday night once again, and you know, ooh, excuse me, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. Ah, I thought my, I thought my mic was bad. It's cool. Wait, hang on, I'm fine. It's Saturday night. We're back again. You know what that means? It's time for Rom Hack Races. We're live tonight from forty thousand leagues under Planet Zebes, and we got a, uh, I think a maker with their first Rom Hack race level this week. Let's give it up for Amazing Chest. They have made us an exciting level this week. Zero Suit Mario. Uh, I had a chance to test this one uh, earlier in development, and uh, you're in for a real treat. This is a really, really, really cool little level here. Uh, Amazing Chest, you might know, I, I, I did a little bit of research uh, before we started. Amazing Chest, a pretty prolific maker here. They've got three different blocks submitted to SMW Central, four different hacks, and one ASM patch. Uh, so they've got some, uh, some really cool work here for us tonight, and I think you're all going to be uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, if you're new and you don't know what this is or I'm why we're recording. doing this at all, uh, this is Rom Hack Races. We meet up every Saturday night to uh, race a brand new Super Mario World Kaizo level that no one has ever seen before, except for the maker, of course, and the testers. Uh, but the racers are just going to have to improvise, use all their wits and skill and determination and sort of sight read their way through. So it's a consistency challenge at obstacles they've already learned. And uh, we're always looking for those exciting one shots uh, to uh, see if anybody can just clear an obstacle right right on their first go. Uh, we have some new testers this week that are helping us out to check this level out. I uh, really want to say thanks to Sulfur X, who was testing this week for us. Welcome, new tester, Walking Eye, coming back again for another week. Thanks so much for helping out. And of course, some returning friends testing. Mithrillionaire, Fen, uh, the RB Pimlico and Electronic Logic also helped us out too. Oh, and me, I was there also. Uh, but I, I just tested the first incarnation, and the rest of them were here all week. Um, what else we got? I don't know much. If you want to learn a little bit more about uh, Romhack Races and what we've got here, you can go to romhackraces.com, our official website. If you want to try this level out for yourself, you can download the patch right from the site or right from our Discord server, which you can get to from the website. And, uh, you know, we all, we've got it, we got it all locked up pretty tight here. Uh, as always, of course, thanks so much to uh, Osu, Mario Kartman, who's helping us run the restream tonight so you all can see everything so nice. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have a name uh, of all the scouts, but I will get them and shout them out as well. Uh, as well as uh, Kelgand for helping us out behind the scenes with the bot and everything. Fen for just doing all that they do. And, of course, uh, D4 and Dr. No always helping us out as well. Uh, I'm Glitch. You probably knew that, but if you didn't, hi, it's nice to meet you. I will be bringing you the play-by-play -play tonight, and if you have any questions or anything about what's going on in the, in the level or how Kaizo Mario works, eh, really anything at all, uh, please feel free to just shout it out in chat. I can read chat too, and uh, you know I can uh, be happy to help you out. Oh, thank you so much, Star-Lord. <laughs> doing, doing my job for me here. Uh, Star-Lord is helping a scout. What's up, Dot? Thank you. Welcome, new scout. Thank you so much. And Captain Blueprint as well. Two new scouts tonight. Uh, the scouts do a really important job. They watch uh, all the other streams that are on right now and let us know if anybody is going to take the lead and make sure we try to rotate everybody in. There are more than four racers here, um, but uh, you don't see them all because if we put everybody on screen, it'd be too tiny and the bit rate would die. And you wouldn't get to see anything at all. So the scouts are really helping us out, uh, doing great work and uh, sitting in the control room with all the screens, letting us know if we should put anybody else up on the restream. So thank you both, uh, all uh, new scouts and returning scouts. Thank you so much for that. I'll give you, I'll give you a merit badge. <laughs> I don't want to make too many scout jokes, but uh, I'll give you a merit badge for helping out. We got Louis Doucet, returning, uh, returning favorite. Germ Dove, returning favorite. Halcyon, returning favorite. B2DE, returning favorite here to start us off. But I'm sure we'll see some other racers as time goes on. Uh, good luck to everybody. 
Thank you so much. Amazing chest, our maker tonight, and uh, let's get ready to. Well, I can't get we we can't get ready to rumble because I think that phrase is trademarked. So uh, let's get ready to do something resembling rumbling. Deep in the underground, Mario awakes and finds his power is gone. Unable to breathe the toxic alien air, he has only seconds to return to his ship. So uh, let's see how uh, see how we do here. This is I got a chance to see this one ahead of time a little bit. This is as a tester. This is a very ambitious level and i think you're gonna like what you see here so first and foremost what in the heck is going on uh yeah nobody can uh jump and uh it's not really obvious if you're watching it but the racers have sure noticed this uh mario as they found out in the intro has lost all his powers so we got to get him back now uh keep your eye on germ dove in the upper right here making some big progress halcyon in the lower left so uh because mario can't jump He's got to stand on these dolphins, and they are a little platform, and they'll push him up. And uh, that is how we're going to get lifted up into the air here. And you really need to do that because these Rip Van Fish are uh, just taking a nap here in this cave, but they're going to wake up when Mario gets close and uh, sort of chase after him. So a couple of fish here and Halcyon now kind of learning how to move to get the fish out of the way. Uh, since they can't jump, They've got to time their motions with the cycles of the dolphins jumping up and down to make sure that they are in the air when the fish are close. But the thing is, they have the ability to kind of choose when the fish wakes up. Because just like Thwomps, uh, Rip Van Fish, that's their official name. Louis Doucet, though, making some progress, though. Upper left, keep your eyes peeled. Haha, -ha, too short of a timer. Uh, but fish have a little bit of a range. Uh, they will sleep until Mario gets close enough. And as long as you stay outside that range, just like activating a thwomp, um, the fish won't wake up at all. And uh, it's sort of like, um, I don't know, everybody play like Don't Wake Daddy. You're a kid, you know, the board game, you have to move the little pieces around. Got to press the alarm clock, see if dad wakes up. It's kind of silly, really, you know, but, but it's sort of like that. It's like a, like a fish-based version of Don't Wake Daddy. Only daddy is a fish, and it's not a board game, it's a video game. B2, ah, looking for some movement here through these fish. This is uh, kind of a cool brain puzzle, really. The players are just trying to figure out, like, how to move. It looks like Halcyon might have a good idea here, trying to wake up a fish and then kind of, like, back up and wake the other fish up. But they've got to all figure this out uh, with uh, with regard to the dolphin cycles. So some, some brain work here. Don't wake daddy. I, I, don't, I don't know about you other 90s. 90s kids but some of those board game commercial songs are just absolutely burned into my brain you want to talk about rent free here goes halcyon though making a break for it maybe home free in the uh lower left but they have a little bit more to learn one thing we haven't pointed out here uh there is a low timer check the timer in the uh, upper right um i think it's a little bit more lenient than it used to be uh, it used to be a mad dash. I appreciate the lead. I, that, that was one of my suggestions. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to take credit for that one. It's, this is amazing chest design here. But uh, it is still a very, very short timer and a mad dash to get to the end of the section. And I like that as cheese prevention, right? The, the racers need to keep freaking moving. Uh, there are a lot of options. They could maybe go back and run back and forth and try to dodge the fish in a lot of different ways. Uh, but that timer really keeps them on their toes. And it also encourages them to come up with strategies here that are effective. They don't want to waste too much time. And it's really a short timer is a good indicator, really, because it sort of implicitly just tells you something about the level, right? A short timer means it, a short timer is a clue that slow strategies aren't going to pay off, right? You know? Just, just, they're not going to pay off. You know for a fact, well, don't go slow. Whatever I do here, it's not slow. It can't be slow. Some racers making some moves, though. Jank Pickle in the upper right. Looks like they might have a shot. Stew Cat in the lower right. This is a tight section for sure. For sure. But I think the racers are getting a little better here, and it might be Jank Pickle for the win in that pipe with four seconds to go, and they got it. Nicely done. Jank Pickle, the first one. Now they've got, look at this, uh, a freaking Super Metroid power-up. And now the jump is unlocked. Oh, wow. We're getting we're getting all our powers back. Mario is uh, getting all his powers back. And, uh, yeah, now Jank Pickle can move into the next section. I love how this uh, hub room is situated so that your 
continually unlocking different parts of it. They couldn't move to the right at first because they couldn't jump over the pokey. Now they can, so they can explore the next section. And it looks like we got a we got a double fight here. Mr. Hank Scorpio as well doing uh, pl plotting to take over the upper left corner, but Proto Pizza might have something to say about it in the lower left. Three racers right now. Look at this read though. Holy moly. And uh, Jank Pickle's going to make it two, two power-ups and maintain a really strong lead. Mr. Hank Scorpio, not too far behind. But that is a big read. Look at the power of, that wasn't really a one-shot, but what, two or three shot? Getting through that section quickly really just made the difference for them there and put them in a really strong position. So it's on uh, Mr. Hank Scorpio, Proto Pizza, or somebody else to kind of catch up right now. Meanwhile... Meanwhile, Jank Pickle has got the spin jump. Uh, a logical progression for the power-ups upgrading. Uh, first, you get the regular jump, you get the more powerful spin jump. And so we're going through this gold kind of colored section now that they can spin jump off the top of the pokey. Great utility, man. I'm loving it. You know, first it's a wall, then it's an obstacle. You jump on it. Really good stuff. And now Jank Pickle is going to have to make some kind of quick spin jump reads here to get through. Uh, I don't think anything, not, nothing here that I don't think these players would be very uh, unfamiliar with. And I think that's a that's a big strength of this level, that it, it, it's extra readable. Nothing behaves strangely here. There's not a really whacked out sort of gimmick to learn. Uh, the players are just using skills that they definitely already have. And I, I think that owes to a lot of the kind of quick uh, progression here from a lot of these racers. So Jank Pickle taking a little bit of time to read uh, the gold statue in these uh, kind of re-grab spin obstacles. Some of these uh, spin jumps are kind of tight because you do have to re-grab in between them. Uh, for those that don't know, Mario falls more slowly in the air when you are holding the jump button versus when you're not holding it. And sometimes you can double tap the jump button to get a very wide jump that also is very low. And that's what the racers need to do here. It's a subtle moment of articulation. You could, you could, re-grabs is kind of a, an archaic term for them. It's not very descriptive, but it's the term that's stuck around. Uh, you could kind of think of it more as a double tap jump. I think that would maybe be a, a good kind of modern terminology. You're using double tap jumps to uh, make those uh, low trajectories. It's not really obvious in just to see it, but it's a really good, uh, really kind of tough thing to master. Sort of the uh, the ollie or the kickflip of Kaizo. It, it, easy to learn, maybe tough to use right all the time. We got some more catching up behind, though. Jank Pickle better get a move on here. Mr. Hank Scorpio, Proto Pizza, B2DE81, getting caught up in the uh, crossfire of the second section. You know, some have said it's a zany action, a crazy contraption, but the fun is catching. <laughs> it's mousetrap. B2. Oh, yeah. B2 in the lower right. Four seconds in the pipe. Make that three. Make that two, but it doesn't matter. They're out of here. So B2 is going to be putting a little bit of pressure now on uh, Jank Pickle. And here's a good uh, little dichotomy for you as a viewer. What's it going to be? Is Jank Pickle, with more time and experience at this level, presumably more consistency, are they going to get through quickly because of that? Or can B2 come from behind and take it with less time, but just a faster one-shot on some obstacle? Or is it going to be Mr. Hank Scorpio pulling up in the upper left here? So either either of these two, B, B2 or, or Hank Scorpio right now, what are they going to be able to do? Are they going to be able to sight read this and sort of put this all together a little bit faster? And I think that's something that's always really interesting in these races. No lead is safe. And it's extra cool when someone who's in the lead manages to preserve it. Actually, an, an, an unchallenged lead throughout the whole course of a level is actually sort of a rare thing. Jank Pickle, though, looking for a read. They've got to figure out which of the gold blocks to destroy 
so that the statue doesn't fall into the lava. Those statues jump automatically. Looks like Mr. Hank Scorpio knows they want to keep that middle block so that when that statue jumps back to the right, uh, it will have somewhere to land. Proto Pizza, though, land landing on that spin jump tile. So more pressure now. Who could it now? Is it gonna now same thing? Is it gonna be Proto Pizza? Are they gonna be able to take the edge on Mr. Hank Scorpio or B2, who now have more experience than they do? It, it's it's sometimes the experience and the consistency, but uh, it, it's that dichotomy between experience and one shots, right? Do you need the experience or could you just sight read it? It's different players can can make different moves on different days. I hope you're all feeling I'm on the edge of my seat right now. This is such a good race. I, I really, really, really just like this as a race level. And I'm going to give big credit to uh, Amazing Chest and the testers for working together to tune this one up. I think this came off so well. Oh, geez. Who's it going to be now? Look at, the, look at the sink up here. What in the world? Oh, my gosh. I love this race. I, this might be one of the better. I, I just love this race right now. Well, they're, they're always good levels, they're always good gameplay, but this this race in particular is just really got me on the edge of my seat. Because now B2 and Mr. Hank Scorpio seem to have the right idea to, to fluidly get out of this part. Uh, while Jang Pickle has taken a little bit of extra time to figure it out. No shame in that, of course, but uh, you know it, it could be anybody's, anybody's moment on any day. Could it be, though? Jank Pickle definitely has got that middle block now. This, I remember from testing, this section in particular is a little bit tricky. The jumps are tough to articulate. Remember those, those double tap re-grabs. If you're not familiar with how those work, uh, they are certainly contributing to a little bit of uh, the tightness here. If you're wondering maybe why do they just crash into munchers or something. Oh, the, the jumps are tough to do because you kind of have to press the button more than once. And Mr. Hank Scorpio now in B2, keep your eyes on the upper left and lower right respectively. They have both been to the end and they have got this part dialed in you're not wrong except there is one more little trick here at the end so the question is do they realize what they did wrong and if so can they get back here who's going to get back first to be able to get this is it going to be mr hank scorpio they know they know what they did look at that consistency and mr hank scorpio is going to clear this section ahead of everybody else who got here with that really good consistency. Once they had it dialed in, they knew it, and they, they went for the goal. So now we got one more power unlocked, and there's the lead change. Mr. Hank Scorpio managing to come out ahead with a quicker read through that gold section. And now we've got swimming powers. So after everything else, Mario is able to swim up to the top here. And uh, it might be a little bit unclear, uh, but the player can hold L or R to activate the water. So uh, if you're wondering why they sometimes just seem to fall out of the water, it's because this is like an activated power-up. Uh, the uh, Mr. Hank Scorpio here is turning the water on and off with the button. That is a little bit tricky to get used to, uh, and they're going to have to optimize their movements a little bit through this section as well. Um, the thing about it is that you know, water slows you down. It really is just like jumping into water. So if you're running real fast and suddenly you dive into water, now you're going spoosh. And you're going very slowly. So the players are going to have to figure out how to compensate for that uh, that little bit of a uh, slowdown bounce. Holy moly, we got to swim quickly. Look at this, yo, the sync up. Jank Pickle and B2 getting completely synced up and uh, grabbing that swim power up at the same time. So we've got three out of four right now on the final section, but uh, oh, I think that's make that four. Four on the final section, because uh, never one to be counted out. Even though they're not on screen, they are a threat lurking. Louis Doucet coming out here, uh, managing to get to the fourth section in just about the same amount of time. So who's it going to be? It is a dead heat now. I think most of these racers have about the same amount of experience. Uh, with this section, Mr. Hank Scorpio did get here first, so they got a little bit more. So what's it going to be? Dead Heat. Is Mr. Hank Scorpio going to be able to use their little bit of extra experience to give them the edge? Or is someone going to be able to read this just a little bit more quickly? Could it be a fifth racer that isn't even on stream right now? Uh, big shout out to the scouts for watching, watching this very closely. We're trying not to miss any clears here. 
Once again, a short timer in this section, so there's, there's no time to dilly-dally. And uh, even though there's no environmental danger, uh, the racers are still going to have to move really quickly. And optimizing, uh, optimizing your swim can be, a, can be a tricky thing. One method I like to use is uh, overhand tapping A and B on the controller to just mash that swim button as fast as you can. Uh, tends to get you a little bit, a little bit more consistent speed. And speaking of consistent speed, I think this race is really going to come down to this final obstacle here. I love this. I, I don't know. I can't even really recall a race that got this close with so many racers at the end, but it looks like this one's going to do it. 15, almost 16 minutes in, and we've got four here at the grab block part at the end. Now, uh, this is tough. This is, a, this is a pretty tough thing to optimize because the racers have to deal with a lot in this moment. Keep your eyes on Louie. Looks like he might have this part dialed in. First of all, there's no such thing as um, sprite buoyancy in this. What that means is there's a certain property in the game that uh, sprites will under sprites underwater will act as though they're underwater. They float more. Uh, in this case, the grab blocks don't have that. Oh my word, Louis Doucet, I thought that was it. All eyes on the lower left, if you would please. We may have a clear pretty soon. But uh, in this case, the grab blocks don't sink. So you throw them up as though they were in the air. Now you rise underwater more quickly when you're not holding an object. And when you up throw the object, you can swim faster. So there's Louie using that really clean up throw to make it out of that section in time. Holy moly, with the moon and three seconds to spare. What power. What, 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 a, what a powerful finish, yeah. A clean, clean and consistent win, even grabbing the moon. Couldn't ask for more style on that. So uh, even though there were some big plays and some big lead changes in the end, it was Louis Duce. Very nicely done. Now it is a tight race for second. I don't 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 blink. Don't get up. Don't go away. Don't just 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 sit down. Sit down. Sit down. We got more going on here. Halcyon coming in the lower left. Jank Pickle, Mr. Hank Scorpio B2, and it's still a super hard fought race for second. I think all the positioning in this level is going to be really really tight. So keep your eyes peeled. Now, th this Louis made this part look easy, but this grab block section at the end is a little bit more difficult than it might seem. The racers have to first be holding L or R in order for the water to be on in the first place. Then, they have to throw the grab block, but it moves really fast because there's no sprite buoyancy. So they have to throw the grab block up cleanly, and that means controlling your horizontal drift in this moment. When Mario is moving right and left, uh, in the air, underwater, no matter what, uh, objects that are thrown or dropped will inherit some of Mario's momentum. And in this case, you want to not be drifting very much when you up throw the grab block, because if you do, the grab block will kind of drift into the wall. So it looks like Jank Pickles definitely got the idea here, staying centered. Halcyon has also got the right idea, but they need to go quickly because they need the grab block to kill the pokey at the very top, and looks like Halcyon might have it here. Oh, no moon, but a strong finish, and a 14. Nicely done, and a good second place from Halcyon. Really, really just kind of smashing through that last section. But that's why they need the grab block in the first place. If they move too quickly, uh, too slowly rather, through that up throw section, the block will time out, and it will just poof out of their hands, it doesn't exist, and uh, then they can't kill the pokey with it, and they gotta try again. So I, I really like the, I guess you could say like the inherent timer pressure. Jank Pickle, let's go. Jank Pickle up there in that pipe looking for a strong third. Can they get it before the time runs out? Oh, you hate to see it. Oh man, you hate to see it. They were a little too slow. Ah, geez. And that's what you get with those tight timer levels. Once you know it, you still have to optimize it. But that's what I mean about there isn't really a lot of environmental danger here. There's not fire that shoots at the player and makes them stay on their toes. Jank Pickle with that consistency. Let's go, pal. Oh my gosh, that's like the very next attempt. Dude, not to be denied. That was just like, no. Jank Pickle said, no way. I am getting that third place tonight. Well done, well done. And the sub 20 too, sharp. Sharp, sharp. There's our podium, but uh, hang out. We got more to talk about. We got, we got more to talk about. 
But that's I say, that's that's what you get with this um oh, with that tight optimization. I like that it's an it's just is a threat. You just have to move quickly. There's nothing that really forces you to move quickly. You, you know, there's no fire chasing you, there's no bullets raining down on your head or whatever, but the low timer just kind of makes that happen automatically. I really I don't know. Maybe this is a personal thing. Maybe it's just because I've been ankle deep in uh, KLDC write-ups all afternoon. But uh, I really think that it would be a cool thing if makers focused more on creating threats out of things that don't just kill you when you touch them. I think that's a, I don't know, it, it wax philosophic. allow me to wax philosophical for a moment. But I think this level's big strength is that it just looks like a normal level. You know, sometimes Kaiser levels just really, like, are so full of, of, of death blocks and muncher ceilings and, and, and tiles that indicate behavior and, and just, like, blocks with skulls on them and stuff. Glowing danger slime that kills you and reverses your controls and stuff. Yeah, I think levels really just... I think they have a certain real classiness when they just put pressure on you in some other way. You're not going to die if you touch the wall here. If you touch the wall too much, you're going to go too slow, and that's going to kill you. B2, though, not getting killed by anything. Nice ascent. Getting out of here alive. Good job. That's a very, very strong finish. Oh, don't don't be fooled like, oh, well, if they didn't get on the podium, they're not good players. Uh, no, don't be fooled. That's a silly thing. This level is tough. And uh, sub-20, sub sub-hour, sub day for this level is uh, really good, honestly. You're watching strong players race against other strong players here. We got Mr. Hank Scorpio. We got Germ Dove in the upper right. Stew Cat. Proto Pizza. Also, Louie, thank you for the raid. If y'all are having fun tonight, if you enjoy the commentary, head on over to romhackraces.com and uh, why you can play this level for your very own self. You could download the patch. You could download any of the patches we've ever raced. It's amazing. There's 216 of them. You could jump on the Discord server and uh, talk shop with us or get some help on your next ROM Hack Race project with uh, the ROM Hack Race's base ROM. Heck, you don't even have to make a ROM Hack Race level. You can just use the ROM Hack Race base ROM for whatever you want to make. It's pretty handy and has a lot of cool quality of life features, courtesy of our pal Ampersam. All this and more on ROMHackRaces.com. If you have questions or anything, uh, please feel free to just shout it out. If you missed something or don't understand or want to learn a little bit more about Kaizo or something unrelated, that's cool. Um, there, you know, say there's, there's only so much commentary and, and analysis I can give on exactly the same obstacles. But I know sometimes folks come in late, so uh, if you are uh, if you're unfamiliar, please please don't hesitate to ask. We've got Mr. Hank Scorpio here, Germ Dove, Stu Cat working hard on the third section. And Proto Pizza working with these statue jumps on the third. Or four, fourth section, Proto Pizza on the third. B2, thank you for the raid. Really solid win tonight. I'm sorry, second, solid second place. But now, yeah, second place is a win. That's just, the second place is just number one twice. Jack Pickle, yo, that was a very strong win. You got third, in case you, in case you were wondering or didn't know. That's a strong third place tonight. You had the lead for quite a while, but no lead is safe in a ROM hack race, unfortunately. Oh, no, Germ Dove. <laughs> I thought they were going to get it. I didn't want to curse them. Oh. Yeah, we had uh, we had actually had a lead change, I think, two or three times in this level. Like I said, it's, it's very... Actually, honestly, it's uncommon for someone to hold the lead and have as, as strong of a lead sometimes as Jank Pickle did for a while. Um... It is, uh, it really, leads change a lot during these races, and the player that gets to a section first is not always guaranteed to, to be the one out first. But that was a really strong strong play in general, and, uh, it, you know, the getting switched up at a section or just having a rough time, that can happen, you know? That's not, I, I always say that, like, to get, to get turned, to get confused and turned around at one section, you know, at something, that doesn't a bad player make, you know? That's all. It, it's there's it, it's just, just different stuff, you know. This level's tricky.
What's the difference between ROM Hack Race's base ROM and Lunar Magic? Oh, um, the, the ROM Hack Race's base ROM is like a canvas. Lunar Magic is the program that hacks Mario World. So, uh, you know, L L Lunar Magic is like Photoshop, and uh, the uh, ROM Hack Race's base ROM is like a pre made canvas with lots of cool stuff to use. Wow, we're dead even on save or kill the Rip Van Fish. That's kind of impressive, really. There are lots of things. So, so Lunar Magic is, you can use Lunar Magic to, to open up Mario World, get under the hood, and, and hack vanilla Mario World. Oh, yo, Germ Dove. I love it. I love it. I love it. They, uh, they didn't want to leave that moon behind. I, they, they, they died for the moon originally, but they came back with enough time to grab it on the rebound. I like that. Good job, Germ Dove. But yeah, Lunar Magic is the tool to edit Mario World. Uh, that you can open the ROM up, get under the hood, rearrange things. Certain people, um, ROM hack races among them, make uh, what's called like a base ROM. And that just gives you a lot of stuff to use. It saves time. Lots of stuff that the, the regular game doesn't have. Quality of life improvements to the code, special blocks that have helpful functions. Um, you know, just a, just a big kind of art supply box of tools and things to help make uh, make better stuff and make stuff easier. Mr. Hank Scorpio, I think we're good with seven seconds. No moon for you. Who is it here? Dekudo, 95, in the upper left-hand corner. Working on the third section. We don't need no stinky moon. You call that a moon? If they don't get the moon, do they have to reset? Only if they want to go for true gamer percent ending, which is a secret category that we track on a secret leaderboard. That only true gamers can see if they really believe. And maybe spam an auth alert or two. Well, if you didn't see the clip and you'd like to uh, watch the race again, or maybe you missed it, um, you could check it out on YouTube. Actually, shout outs to uh, anyone who's watching this VOD uh, on YouTube and didn't see it live. Hi, YouTube audience. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it. Drop a subscription. That's what you do over on YouTube, I guess. And uh, yeah, thanks to uh, volunteer ROM Hack Race friends for uploading these. It's a great repository of uh, fun memories, great past moments. That makes me think too. Um, you know, I think uh, I think sometime in uh, if I'm trying to recall the schedule exactly, we are scheduled for a actually a week off uh, sometime in December. Uh, I don't think we had a maker lined up for that week, and um, everybody's kind of on holiday anyway. Plus, it gives us a chance to just like not be working for a week and have uh, oh proto pizza no. Uh, Gives us a chance to uh, not be working for a week and uh, do some do some training and stuff behind the scenes. Get some get some stuff tidied up around here, uh, and kind of work on some new projects as well. Um, but if we're not gonna have a race that week, uh, and and as such we're not going to uh, be doing all the work behind the scenes each week to get a race ready, it might be a, a chill and cool idea to I don't know have some kind of 
best of kind of thing. Maybe like uh, like ROM hack races, best moments, or you know favorite races or something. Play some some old highlights. Maybe uh, put together some kind of like highlight reel from the past year. Say on New Year's Eve, that'd be perfect. You know, maybe put together a little highlight reel or something. You know, some maybe some kind of fun or uh, some something like that that uh, would be would be easier. So if you have any ideas for that, we do have a, a forum thread on our Discord for like uh, special events, feedback, that kind of thing, as well as a sign up for volunteers. Uh, we uh, really appreciate the new volunteers that we've got, uh, new scouts and new testers this week. So thank you so much for that. Um, you know, always looking for more folks uh, to train on some more things. More person power does mean more special events. Um, you know, iron helps us play. So uh, if that sounds like you and uh, you'd like to contribute a little bit of your time, you can sign up over on the website, and uh, we'll be in touch pretty soon. Hey, thanks for the raid, Mr. Hank Scorpio. Great wins tonight. Great, great clear. In other, uh, in other Super Mario World news, I'm excited to say, um, I I'm feeling great today. Feeling excellent. Got a little, got a little bit of a big weight off my shoulders. Uh, I just like like just a couple of hours ago, I have finished my KLDC scoring and write-ups. Uh, I know the other judges are very close to being done as well. I think I'm the second to turn them in. Um, I know everyone is getting very close. Everyone has been working really, really hard. All the other judges have put in just as much time. Um, I am really excited to say that I am done with mine. I've got all 72 levels written up, uh, reviewed. Scored, ranked, and now I'm working on the fun stuff of just doing uh, like honorable mention, special consideration awards, talking about my thoughts and experiences, you know, all, all that easy fun stuff. That's no big deal. You know what else is no big deal? Ender of Games in the upper right getting into the fourth section. Proto Pizza as well. Stew Cat and Endless Ascent. Yo, all four. It's a 4v4v4v4v4 battle on the fourth section. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. I, I, I'm happy to do it. It was a tremendous amount of work. I, I, I've, I've, my, my document is going to clock out over 200 pages of review, analysis, scoring, screenshots, descriptions, explanations, observations, etc. Um, I really wanted, it was important to me to match the really high effort from all the makers. Uh, you know, 72 people took the time to make some really absolutely splendid levels uh the competition is staggeringly tight actually i knew i knew it was going to be tight but actually the competition is like sta on on my sheet staggeringly tight i i'm super impressed um i spent a lot of time figuring out exactly how many points to give and and whether or not i thought the score was fair uh, i i hope the community can can be pleased with this and uh you know, just, just have a nice time kind of going through it all, um, myself and all the other judges. But I'm really excited. I just I feel great, honestly. I, I feel like I accomplished a real big thing here. And uh, I think I think y'all are going to like it. I'm trying to trying to kind of write the book on, write a book on good Kaizo design in general, using all these levels as, a, as an example and a launch pad to talk about, uh, you know, certain things that work, certain things that don't work. Um, you know, kind of how to how to help everybody build good designs. I'm absolutely stunned at what we got this year. I, this has been, I think, for me, the the just the absolutely best KLDC ever. They keep getting better and better, and the the quality of of submissions just improves. I mean, they've always been good. They they haven't been bad at a certain point, but the 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 competition is staggeringly tight. I'm uh, I'm on, I, I'm gonna have to really sit down and scratch my noggin to figure out how I might uh, how I might break a couple of ties just in my own ranking. I feel like I do want to kind of give give a ranking, uh, but um, you know level levels succeed 
I, I will say this without getting into too much of it, because I, I, I want to be able for all the judges to have a have a dedicated wrap up stream where we like spend a whole evening kind of talking about our thoughts and things. But I think uh, I will say this, you know, I think in general, when it comes to why does the level succeed? The good levels. I mean, you got, some, you, know, you got some good, got some bad, got some in between, just like everything. Overwhelmingly good, I'd say. But when it comes to the good ones, the, the wow, holy moly, amazing levels. When it comes to those levels, they all succeed for a variety of different reasons. There is so much diversity in, in this contest. Why is this? Why one level is good might be a, a completely other separate reason. They tend to share some commonalities. There's just good things about level design in general. But um, levels just really succeed at hitting the mark in a lot of different ways and from a lot of different approaches. I, I, I really especially like the, the diversity of creativity in, in this contest in particular. So thank you all. Like, for making these great levels, and I hope to be able to share the results real soon. It's not just me, though. I want to make that clear. It's not just me that's judging. Uh, we got what? We got Louie. We got k -Tune, We got Lungfish. Uh, all exemplary players. And uh, they're also working hard finishing up as well. Hey, jeez. I look away for one second and look who's finishing up. It's Ender of Games. Nicely done. That's a strong clear. And a, yeah, yo. And a 26. I think that's the highest goal tape we've seen. I, I, I really, I know it's silly, but I, I, I appreciate when players go for the, the high tape. It's just nice. It's a nice little vanilla thing from original Mario World that... We all remember and makes us happy. Chef boy Eric up here in the upper right looking for the way out of the third section. Stew Cat, Proto, and Endless swimming their way through number four. Uh, I don't mean to go on about it. I, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm excited for KLDC to wrap up. I, I, I've, it's been quite an amount of time. It's been, been a month or two. I appreciate the patience of the community. Just kind of sticking, you know, being patient and sticking with us while we work on this massive amount of uh, stuff. But I'm very excited to be able to share this. And uh, while I had a lot of fun doing it, I would do it again if you'll have me back, if you if, if you like my work here. But uh, I, I'm also kind of glad to be done. <laughs> Man, 200 pages of analysis on 72 Kaizo Mario levels that really goes in depth and takes consideration at each moment. Uh, that that's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to do. I I probably put 30 to 40 hours into this work here. Chef Boy Eric though, look at that doing work to get that uh, air swim, and they are out of the uh, third section just like that. I try to stay impartial as a commentator, and I, I mean, I am. I'm rooting for everybody, you know. I, I hope all the racers have a good time. But uh, narrative speaking, I think it would be interesting here if Chef Boy Eric managed to top this section out before uh, anybody else. It's always something I, I think is kind of fascinating when it comes to races is, like, some sections just absolutely click with some people. Even in a level that otherwise might have been giving them the business in some area or another, sometimes you'll see the light bulb just flash on for some people, and they will just absolutely throttle a section in particular because, for whatever reason, it fits very well with how they play or what they've trained for or, or something like that. So I always kind of like rooting for those kinds of moments. Also, you know, last thing, I'm I'm really curious to find out who made the KLDC levels. I still don't know. On my on my honor, I have just played through them. I don't I don't know who made what. And uh, there's some really good ones, and I, I want to you know I want to know whose hand I'm shaking in some cases. <laughs> so I'm very I'm curious, you know. 
I'm the la I'm actually the last person in the universe to find out who made some of like my favorite levels from this contest. So it'll it'll be a fun to kind of guess the makers and do that. It's like uh, it's like at a Halloween party when you gotta stand around and guess everybody's costume. But I know, you know, maybe it's a little old news for everybody else, but uh, thanks again for KLDC. It was a real treat, and I'm honored to have the trust uh, personally. I, I think I speak for all the judges, but for me personally, I, I'm, I'm honored to have the, the trust and the faith in the community, from the community, to, to, to be in this type of position. Uh, I, I hope to show you why, why that trust isn't misplaced. Oh, it's a calm, chill Saturday night, and I hope you're feeling comfy, too. How are you? What's what's on your mind tonight? Like I said, there's only so much commentary I can give on exactly the same obstacles, but if you have a question, don't feel don't feel dumb. It's okay to ask. We're looking for Proto Pizza, Chef Boy Eric, Stew Cat, or Endless Ascent to get out of this vertical water section first. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, holding down the LRR button will turn on the water, and letting it go will, uh, turn it off. So, yeah, not a, not a tap on or off toggle. You just hold it. Um, which actually goes a long way toward making some of these sections a little more difficult, especially the grab block part, because you have to do this whole sequence while also holding, uh, holding down the R or L button. Today's your birthday? Whoa, oh, just... Happy birthday, Captain Blueprint. Thanks for celebrating by doing some scout for ROM hack races. Really appreciate that. Hope you have a really, really good birthday. Happy Tuesday birthday. I thought I heard there was someone else's birthday today, too. <laughs> Alright, I got I got I, I can't resist this one. I got a I got a slightly PG thirteen joke, so you know, kids come ear earmuffs on this one, but uh you know, there's just there's a lot of birthdays right around now. Man, a, a lot of people's yeah, a lot of people's parents were really, uh, really getting busy about nine months ago. <laughs> yeah, so was that Valentine's Day? Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. A lot of, lot of birthdays nine months after Valentine's Day. I don't know. It's kind of a coincidence. Seemed to be an awful lot of birthdays around that time. I, You know, I uh, that makes me uh, kind of wonder. I bet you that in other, um, in other cultures that have, like, other cultural equivalents i mean valentine's day is kind of hallmark holiday but you get what i mean like they have other kind of love based couples based romance based holidays and things I, I wonder like in those cultures like there are birthdays like nine months after that date you know what i mean like like oh there's a lot of birthdays after valentine's day like oh in in some other country there's a lot of birthdays nine months after that country's you know celebration of couples and romance The Stanley Cup, the Stanley Cup win. <laughs> Is that the one in Canada? <laughs> or maybe the one in Pittsburgh. That's a big hockey town, too. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, but I... It's just something really funny to me. Oh, Chef Boy Eric, man, they almost had it. Is the prophecy gonna come true? Is Chef Boy Eric gonna... gonna rip through this section? But, uh, you know, I, I just think, like, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't call myself, I wouldn't describe myself as a sports fan necessarily, but I like hockey. Okay, you know, I, I grew up watching the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey game, listening to the exciting commentary of Mike Lang, the one of the best sports announcers ever, in my opinion. Uh, not that I know too many others, but, uh, you know, I, I, I like I like hockey well enough. I, I think it's a cool sport. I think if I had to pick a sport that was like my favorite, it, it would be hockey. Um, I, I always liked it. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, Pittsburgh Penguins. I when I was a kid, uh, my dad and I went to some hockey games. I got to see uh, I got to see Yarmir Yager play in Pittsburgh like live. Um, I'm pretty sure I got to see Mario Lemieux play as well. Uh, granted, we were way up in the cheap seats, so I was looking through binoculars, but I saw him. He was there. <laughs> I was there. It was like uh, that was like '90s Penguins. It was like Tom Barrasso was in goal. Uh, Ken Reggett. Uh, it was neat. I, mean, I was a little kid, so to me, I didn't necessarily understand that it was like a special moment, um, you know, in 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 the sport. But yeah, it was it was neat to see see some legends like that on the on the ice. Uh, I'm pretty sure Tom Barrasso was in goal at the time. Um, I can't think of the other people, but uh, I've just always thought that like the Stanley Cup just sounds like such an underwhelming name for the the ultimate prize in hockey. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> like you know some other sports you win like the pendant or the World Cup. You know, it, it's the World Championship, or you you become a black belt, third degree, and like, oh yeah, you're a hockey player, eh? Like, oh yeah, I won the Stanley Cup. <laughs> like, I don't know what's special about this. Like, I don't know, some guy named Stanley had it. That's why they call it the Stanley Cup. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> there's just something about that. I don't know. It's funny to me. It's not. It doesn't have some big illustrious name. You know, it's just some guy named Stanley. That's his cup. We give it out to the best hockey team. Everyone's real excited, and then you get to like have it and do whatever you want with it. That's another funny thing about hockey. And I don't. They, well, they do call it Lord Stanley's. So that's true. Um, but I don't know if other sports are like this. But in hockey, apparently, when your team like wins the Stanley Cup, like there is one Stanley Cup, as far as I understand. Maybe there's a couple or whatever, but like there is like one. There's like the freaking Stanley Cup. And then, like, your team just gets to, like, have it for, like, a whole year. It's just, like, yours. L like, like a wrestling belt or something. So you just, like, get to do whatever you want with it, really. Like, whatever the, whatever the people on the team decide. Like, all the players on the team, like, get to have it for a day. And just get to, like, do whatever they want with it. So they just, like, take it around places and, like, take it to amusement parks and, and, and like, all kinds of stuff. I'm sure they clean and sanitize it. There's a guy that comes with it, too. Oh, that's awesome. Like, the, the caretaker for it. I didn't know that. So, like, you and the caretaker for the Stanley Cup just get to, like, just do whatever you want. You could just, like, eat some cereal out of it or throw it at the bottom of your pool or just, like, put a bunch of beverages in it or, or try to get the moon and die right at the end like Chef Boy Eric. I can't believe it. They're about to fulfill the prophecy. Oh, they were one jump away from the Stanley Cup. Oh. That timer, though. But I just, I, I don't know if other, like, sports have that sort of thing. But I just love that about hockey. Like, it, it's, it, it seems kind of like a, like, just a Canadian thing to do. You know, like, oh, okay, you won the cup, eh? So, uh, you know, it's yours. You get to do whatever you want with it, like, for a whole year. Like, I mean, you know, don't be a hoser with it. But I guess we can't stop you. Like, so just do whatever you want. <laughs> like, here's your cup. Like. I just think that's great. It's so friendly. It's so very, very Canadian. Proto pizza. Oh my word. Sneaking in there at the very end with one second to go. 
And uh, man, just just barely eked out over Chef Boy Eric in that. They almost, Chef Boy Eric, they almost fulfilled the prophecy. They were the chosen one. And they just about ripped through that section faster than people that had been there longer. Yeah, that, nice consistency on that up throw. Yo, Dekudo95 working hard over here in the lower, I'm sorry, upper left. Yeah, hey, here's your cup. Good job being the best hockey team. I don't mean this as an offensive stereotype. I, I, please tell me if this is like, hey, I take exception to your Canadian impression. I mean this with love. I 100% I mean this with, with love. Uh, so just correct me if I'm off base here. I, I grew up listening to a lot of the uh, what, the old Bob and Doug McKenzie sketches on uh, on uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh, I actually have the Bob and Doug McKenzie cassette tape with uh, Getty Lee on it. And Chef Boy Eric, oh man, they get to take the Stanley Cup over to Kennywood for the day. They're gonna they're gonna be drinking drinking some drinks out of that Stanley Cup tonight. Good job, Chef Boy Eric. I'm close enough to the border. I have seen Canada. I, as, as a Pennsylvanian, I, I've been to Erie. I've seen Niagara Falls. I've, I've looked across and pointed at Canada from, from the far shore. Not the far shore from Tunic. Although, well, I won't, I won't spoil my Tunic fan theory, but we'll just leave it at that. We got Fernap in the upper right. Dekudo in the upper left, Stew Cat and Endless Ascent working on the fourth section. Fernap on the second and Dekudo on the third. Good work though, good work. You like to see the the determination. Here you go. Have have the cup. <laughs> yeah, good job. You did it. You're the best hockey team. See you next year. I'll try to get the cup back. In the meantime, you can have it. <laughs> you know, don't scratch it or anything. You can bring it back when you're done. <laughs> just that's so endearing man it's so i love that does any other sport have that i'm actually curious does any other sport have its equivalent of the stanley cup Where, like you know i know like you know uh what in football you get uh you get rings i think you get like uh super bowl rings to wear cool but not quite a cup uh you can't really you can't really eat cereal out of a ring it falls right through the middle most you could probably do is take over Middle Earth, which I guess is kind of cool. I guess. Just, just doesn't do well with the Bechtel test and there's a lot of walking, but I, I guess Middle Earth is kind of cool. The Lombardi trophy, but that goes in the team's trophy case. Is there one Lombardi trophy or do they just get a Lombardi trophy? Or does the team just like get to have the Lombardi trophy in their case the whole time? Hey, Chef Boy Eric, good job. You ripped through that third or fourth section like nothing. WWE has the Andre the Giant Battle Royale. Oh, that's sick. Andre the Giant is my undisputed favorite wrestler of all time and for all eternity. I'm not much of a wrestling fan. I've got it, most of it through osmosis by friends who were more into it than me. I like it. I respect it for the choreography and stuntsmanship. But, uh, and stunts womenship. But, uh... And st I'm, I'm assuming stunts non-binary ship as well. Just can't think of any of them off the top of my head. But uh, Andre the Giant, far and away, the best wrestler of all time. I will fight uh, for that hill. And I'm sure Andre would appreciate it because he's just the best. Just can't beat Andre the Giant ever for any reason. Don't even try. Undisputed king of the world. Every former Canadian governor donates a trophy to a sport, but Lord Stanley's Cup is the most well-known one. No one knows the person that gave one to lacrosse. That's very interesting. <laughs> Does it have a name? That's very that's very interesting. Thank you, Niv. The Indy 500 engraves the face of the winner of each race onto the Borg Warner Trophy. So are, you, so are you saying that NASCAR drivers' ultimate goal is to become one with the Borg? Literally? Oh, jeez. I could go on and on about why I like Andre the Giant so much. But I think Andre the Giant is an inspirational person. And he was bigger than life. And he didn't shy away from that. 
there was there was something different about him. You know what I mean? He was he was different. He was built different, and he didn't shy away from that. He didn't. He he, he made that into his strength. You know, and I, I like that. You know, because I think all of us are too big somehow. You know, we're all giants somewhere, and that same thing might be a problem. You know, he didn't fit into the regular world, literally. He, he didn't fit on planes and buses and things. It, it was a challenge for him to, to deal with his bigness. But he made it into a strength, and he leaned in. He didn't shy away from who he was, and he made that into an asset. And I just I love that. I, I love him. He was a kind and good person. Have fun storming the castle. Uh, honestly, Andre the Giant just... I think, honestly, I think Andre the Giant ranks right up there in the Pantheon with Mr. Rogers, Steve Irwin, Bob Ross. I, I, I absolutely think that you could include Andre the Giant in that, uh, in that little, uh, that little Pantheon as well. Oh, Indy, not NASCAR, sorry. Hey, let's go. Endless Ascent. Three seconds to go. Three. Oh, that was more than three on the timer. I like the clown ball at the end, too. That's the ship. I didn't notice that until right now, but there's the clown ball. That's Mario's ship to, to get out. I love that quote so much. I don't like to speak badly of people. I have grown up thinking and being told if you can't say something nice about someone, you should not say anything at all. But I must break this rule in this case because I hate Hulk Hogan very much. He is a big ugly goon and I want to squish his face. <laughs> Love you, Andre. Ah, it's all, man. Andre the Giant. There's a song by Kimya Dawson I think you all should listen to. Here's, here's some homework. It's a pleasant song. It's not a rock and roll song. Rock and roll is fun. But if you ever hear someone say you are big, I like giants the softest. The softest. Did you know that you can also follow Kimia Dawson on socials and she's very nice and posts pleasant things? Yeah, go and listen to the song I Like Giants by the recording artist Kimia Dawson. You might know her work from the soundtrack of that old movie Juno. I really, really like her. She's a really splendid little, little. she's a splendid big singer-songwriter with a big heart and a lot to say. I really, really, really like her music a lot. Big inspiration for me. We all become important when we realize our goal should be to figure out our role within the context of the whole. Oh, yeah, uh, K, I, I, I'll, I'll type in a chat for you. Oh, there you go, RB Pimlico. Yo, we, we know Kimya Dawson. We, we know, we know. What, what are some other favorites? I used to cover uh, the beer at shows. I think she's got better songs than that. Hey, yo, let's go, Fernap. Giant leap forward, making their way out of the second section. And gaining the spin jump power. Wait, Kimia Dawson has a song about Captain Lou Albino? Wait, for actual real? Wait, for real? I don't think I knew that. I don't think I knew that. Not to say that what's his name was bad, but Kimya Dawson was the absolute stronger half of the Uncluded. I like they were all right, but man, it really sounded like that that, that vocal uh, collab stuff she did with that hip hop artist. He was good. Like I like his work, but it just really felt like they were just like two songs like fighting, fighting for space on the track. Oh no! Stewcat! So close! We got first name Butt now. Upper left, Fernap, upper right, Stew Cat. Wait, Stew Cat? <coughs> 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 
scouting your run. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm but a simple commentator. If you signed up Bendar Racing, then it ought to be. Uh, if if uh, you don't sign up on the website, then the scouts don't know whose stream to look for. That's the purpose of signing up in the first place, is to just let the um, let the scouts know. Oh, is that why? Oh yeah, check. Oh yeah, yeah. Our our apologies. Yeah, you were were you checked for no restream? Yeah, we give racers the option uh, if they want to race but don't want to actually be included on the restream. So maybe that box was accidentally checked. No problem, just a misunderstanding. But that 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 is the point of this sign up. Uh, to just kind of let the scouts and us know, hey, this many people are looking to get restreamed and be a part of it tonight. Who to track? Ah, no worries. Easy mistake to make. If you want to still be on the restream, we can add you. Just let us know. Yeah, no, no, nothing, no, no, nothing personal. <laughs> no, we're not putting you on. No, not, nothing, nothing personal like that. These races are open for everybody that wants to participate. Well, I mean, if you're almost at the end, I mean, you know, okay, keep, keep, keep your eyes on the road. Let's see what we can do here. Right now we got, uh, we got first name Butt, we got Fernap, Stu Cat, Dekudo, and Don Waffle too, keeping, uh, keeping the pace. Yeah, keep, keep, keep your eyes on the road there, pal. I'm just fooling you. I don't mind, you know, folks. Folks hang out and chat during the race. That's all well and good. I don't mind at all. But uh, you know, some sometimes I do. Uh, sometimes I do uh, deliberately not say the solution to things out loud right away, just in case, you know. Little, little, some sneaky answers here. But uh, yo, it looks like there is no trouble here. Oh, look at this. Oh man, right on the restream. Are we gonna? Oh, you were just waiting. You were just waiting. Just waiting so we can show that off, and there's the moon too. What good timing, Don Waffle, way to play! Oh, they they were they were just hanging back so we could see it. Nicely done. Thank you, scouts too. Really, really appreciate. It. Good job tonight. Big, big shout out to the scouts. I, it, it, the scouting is is sometimes the the janitor work uh, around here. You know, just making sure watch all the streams, let us know. You know, do the thing, have the thing open. Uh, kind of, kind of the cleaning up work sometimes, but it is a really necessary and helpful thing, and uh, really helps these races go, go a long way. Um, or, <laughs> I'm still in KLDC write-up mode. It helps the races be cool, and it shows off all the racers. I'm glad you think so. I think it's kind of fun. You get to just kind of sit in the control room and watch everybody. Well, Charlie Day is the one with the big, uh, <laughs> the big board with all the things written on it with all the connections. So, <laughs> thanks to the raid, Don Waffle, Stew Cat, so close but not enough time in the pipe. Hey, that reminds me too. Yo, click the, uh, click the name in chat. Go and follow some of the racers you've seen here. There are a lot of great Kaizo players, and uh, there's a lot of really, really cool friends that are streaming. So. Uh, you know, I want, please please keep watching Kaizo. I have I haven't been on for a little. I haven't been streaming for a couple of days. I've been just kind of lurking and being a regular person. So make some new friends. And this is the final four. 
Really cool though. We got the got most most of the people through in under an hour. We scheduled two hours for the broadcasts, and uh, it's really cool to see so many clears in this time. Uh, again, these are good players playing here. It, you know, an hour is is, is a, an amount of time, but the level's tough, and everybody brings different skill sets to the table. Everybody's learning, and uh, I really appreciate you know chat hanging out and still being supportive. Right? Let's let's cheer everybody on. It's Romhack races, but. It's a fun community showcase in an event wrapped up as a race. The race is the is the wrapping paper you admire and then you, you take it off to get to the get to the real gift underneath. You know, Mario's been a doctor, a referee, uh, 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 worked at a cookie factory, but he's never been Santa. He's played every sport imaginable, except for hockey. There is no Mario Hockey. Uh, there might have been. Yeah, I seem to recall there were some old... There's been some Christmas-themed present-delivering hacks. I never played Mario and Sonic at the Winter Olympic Games, so I, uh, I never, I know, I wouldn't know. An uneasy alliance, to be sure. As a 90s video game kid growing up, it was very weird to finally one day see Sonic on the cover of Nintendo Power Magazine. That was like, should never happen, would never happen. It was just weird. It was just, it was just absolutely weird. It, it was just like, uh, it was like that photo of that weird, planned crossover tour that never happened between uh, Slipknot and Weezer. And there's a photo of the guy from Weezer standing there with the two dudes from Slipknot. It was it's like that. It's just like th this shouldn't th this shouldn't really exist and somehow here it is. Like seeing Darth Vader shaking hands with Mr. Spock. <laughs> yeah. Or like one of those, uh, like one of those posters you see at a head shop with all the different cartoon characters sitting around in the living room. You know the ones I mean. Stew Cat. Oh, that was so good, though. 
That ascent was so friggin' clean. I thought they were really gonna have it there. That was just like snappy. You know, Slipknot and Weezer could have toured with uh, Queen, or at least Queens of the Stone Age, and then they would have been Squeezer. I don't know why, but I, I've always just... I'm not even too familiar with their work, but I know of them. I've always... Just have this impression that Queens of the Stone Age is just like a like a like a uh, like a crappy off-brand Kmart version of Queen, you know, like a, like a Queen cover band or something. Like, oh, we have Queen at home. We might, we might jostle you. We aim to rustle jimmies. We're going to sway you. <laughs> we are the runners of <laughs> You know, man, if people talk a lot about, like, what the ultimate rock and roll show would be, but I think if if Prince opened for Queen, that would be so fitting. Follow that up with King Crimson. <laughs> and Jack Black is there, dancing around with a plastic saxophone, just making everybody happy. Oh man, Stu Cat. I <laughs> They're so close. They just tend to lose the, the water. They like aren't holding the button or something in that ascent, but they are just like right there. I wonder if they think they have to turn off the water to throw the block but they don't actually they don't need to do that at all oh that's exactly what they're doing yeah oh geez that's just kind of a, a, a misinterpretation here yeah I wonder actually I, I'm starting to think maybe more racers had that same kind of missed assumption. Yeah. What? Yeah, Stucat, I think, is turning the water on and off. They're turning the water off to throw the block and then quickly turn it back on. And, yeah, they don't actually need to do that. You can just throw the block up without turning the water off at all. Uh, in fact, doing that actually makes that a lot harder. And uh, so I'm going to give Stucat and every other player that tried this um, 500 cool points as a consolation prize because they're actually getting through this and succeeding at doing this with like extra inputs that do it the hard way. Oh my gosh, swimming over the spiny too. Can they make it out? Stew Cat, I believe. Three seconds to go. Come on, let's go. Run, run, run. No, no, man, man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that actually makes sense. Yeah, the, 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 it isn't... You can you hold the button to keep the water on, but you don't need to do anything to throw the block. You could just keep the water on and just throw the block. So all you have to do in that part is just keep your hand on the on the uh, R button while you do everything else. Yeah, I, I see how that could be a little bit confusing for people.
You know, I'll, I'll be honest, even uh, at least at least for me, when I was thinking about testing this, you know, I didn't even really think of that. That ne that never even really occurred to me that racers would have this type of confusion. But in retrospect, it makes sense, and that's a really good example of why you know testers and and other eyes and other play styles playing the level. It's a really good idea because they're gonna catch things. Yeah, no, that's I think that's honestly something that's just like really easy to miss. It's just oh yeah, didn't even think of that. Oh sure, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you can't catch everything sometimes, but yeah, my, myself, I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think that, oh, geez, maybe we should tell them that they don't actually need to turn the water off to throw the block. Simple. A simple, simple fix in retrospect, but yeah, it's one of those things that's just, it's hard to anticipate sometimes what misunderstanding the player might make. And it's difficult to compensate for all of that. I mean, you can't hold their hand all the time. If you indicate everything, it's just going to become obscure. So, nah, easy, easy, easy mistake to make. I think for for everybody. Um, yo, 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 real quick, yo. Uh, I gotta stand up, uh, use the restroom real quick. Uh, I will be right back. Getting getting up out of the commentary booth for a second. Uh, hopefully, maybe Stu Cat. Hang on, Stu Cat. Can you get it? All right. Do, do something cool while I'm gone, so you can tell me about it when I get back. Uh, give me a minute. I'll be right back. All right, hey there, what's up? I'm back, we're back. Uh, looks like we're still just all hanging out. First name but, Fernap, Stewcat, Dekudo. And uh, I, I would like you all to know that I'm joined here in in my game lab commentary booth by uh, the internet's number one soft boy, Mallow the Cat. Aw, Stewcat, just in time. Yo, with that extra cat power. Stewcat, able to take the win with a second to go. Hey, GG, oh, thanks for waiting until I got back. Uh, I appreciate that. A little bit of extra cat power. Mallow the cat is here, hanging out with me, sleeping in his favorite chair, being adorable as he is. We got three now, Fernap, first name Butt, and Dekudo. You want to pick up a new kitten tomorrow? Ah, what color? What what's the name of the kitten? What type of markings do they have? Cosmo. Oh, I'd love to hear about the cats that are also joining us for the race. Cosmo. Oh, a naked cat. Those are kind of rare. Also, yo, B2, thank you so much for the 26 months for racing, bringing the hype, bringing the skill. Thank you. Really appreciate that support there, friend. Oh, I love new kitten hype. Thank you. 
Well, that's good. I mean, what else is there for cats to do? I can't. They, just, they, they don't have much of an agenda. They don't play Kaizo. Mallow the, Mallow the cat has played Kaizo exactly twice. One time he booped the controller and did a spin jump. And the other time he pressed the pause button with his head. I think, uh, I think that's enough. As far as cats go, he's done two whole Kaizos. Yeah, yo, seems like the grab block uh, channel at the end of this section has been kind of the holdup for a lot of folks tonight. New kitten's name is Kuro. Nice. Hey, welcome there, Mr. Yam. Yeah, now the tur turning on and off the water is is it is a tricky thing to work with because it makes you go from moving really quickly to moving really slowly. And that is, it's tough to kind of rebound from if you kind of don't move in the right way. Man, I'm just looking at my cat back there like he's so comfy. I'm glad I'm glad everyone's cats are hanging out and com being comfy. And you know, dogs too. Dogs are also good pets. Whatever whatever pets you have. I'm glad they're taken care of and comfy tonight. They deserve it. You know, this is making me think, uh, I still haven't beat Metroid, uh, Metroid Dread yet. I kind of just, like, stopped playing it. I've seen the speedruns and stuff, so I've, like, seen the end boss, so, like, I know how it ends. I just kind of, like, played it for a little while, and, and then I just, like, I was just, like, done. Not, like, done. I, I just, like, kind of lost interest. I don't know. I should go back and finish it, but it's just kind of sitting there half-completed. I actually have only ever played the whole way through Super Metroid. It's the only Metroid game I've beaten, and the only one I've really tried, really, except from Dread, maybe. Uh, I remember playing that. I borrowed that from a friend back in high school, actually. Just a Super Metroid cartridge for good old Super Nintendo. And uh, I had never played it. That was actually just like, didn't even really know that much about it, but 
uh, <laughs> this was kind of funny, but uh, my buddy back in the day, we were in high school, uh, early 2000s, and uh, he uh, ordered all these Super Nintendo games from eBay, and he got this, like, oh, yeah, I got this lot of games. He got, like, 30 or 40 games that all arrived, like, CIB. I mean, I'm talking Metroid, Earthbound, Zelda, Harvest Moon, like, everything. Just a, 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 a freaking Stanley, Lord Stanley's Ransom in video games, collectible stuff now that he got for pennies on the dollar back in the day. And uh, one of those was Super Metroid, so uh, he let me borrow it because I never played it before. And I had such a good time with my first playthrough of that game. I don't, I don't mean to be all 90s gamer on you, but like, no guides, no codes, no nothing. Just me sitting in the basement after school in the, in the evening time, sometimes after I got off work, freaking turn all the lights off and play in the dark. Just me in the basement in the dark playing Super Metroid, old school style. Man, that was fun. That was a really just, I don't know, just a fun experience. I remember that a lot. In fact, the uh, I thought that type of mysticism and magic was kind of gone in video games. And then I played Tunic. Tunic was the game that kind of reinvigorated that same sort of feeling of just like, wow, this world is awesome and just full of stuff to adventure and explore. But every other Metroid game, I never played it. Well, I've played it. I I played. Uh, I have. I, mean, I have a copy of NES Metroid. NES Metroid is legitimately difficult. You want to talk about Nintendo hard? Metroid. NES Metroid. In fact, I'll. Uh, this might be a bold take, but I absolutely think it's backed up with science and evidence. Um, Metroid. If, if 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 the year is 1987 or whatever, I don't remember when the NES everything came out. But let, let's pretend it's you know old school game and you have no no guides, no code, no nothing. You just have to figure it out. What's the harder game to beat, Battletoads or Metroid? Metroid, absolutely. Battle Battletoads get gets held up as the the hard NES game. Oh, it's Battletoads. It's so hard. While it's a challenging game for sure. Um, Metroid is way harder, I think. Metroid is harder, especially if you don't know what to do, because you just have to find it. You just have to make a map and figure it out. This is like back in the days of make a map on paper, which you should still do as a player. Taking physical notes is a great way to reinforce good gameplay habits. But, yeah, Battletoads is memorization, and you just kind of learn, ah, never go here, only do that. Ah, don't stand there, stand over here. Uh, but Metroid, on the other hand, is exploration. You have to you have to figure out where everything is, and that adds another dimension to it. I also think that Metroid is harder than Zelda One. I I th kind of think that is the case by being just a little more difficult to do anything at all. It's a little it's tough to move around. You get your butt kicked in Metroid all the time. Um, it's a little tougher to fight than it is to fight in Zelda 1. And, uh, hey, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm starting to develop a case here that Metroid is one of the toughest games on NES, actually. I'd never really thought about it that way. But, in a way, Metroid is one of the toughest games on NES. I'm trying, I mean, what, what are the other, like, what about Mega Man 1? I think Metroid's harder than Mega Man 1. I've beaten Mega Man 1. Uh, I've beaten most of the NES Mega Mans. It's a tough game, but I but I really think Metroid is harder. The physics in, in Mega Man 1 are better. You just have more agency. In Mega Man 1, you have more agency to run around. You can go back and forth between screens and farm health, which you can also do in Metroid. It's just harder in Metroid. Metroid is just a it's tough as nails to just move around and do the things in the first place. You know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't have the benefit of a very smooth physical system like Mega Man 1 does. I, I, I don't think the physics in Metroid feel bad, but they certainly aren't helping make the game easier the way Mega Man's physics are.
Now, I, I, I just did reviews on 72 KLDC levels and gave them what I feel to be fair and accurate scores. I feel like I've just like, I can analyze any video game right now. <laughs> I have ascended to video game analysis nirvana. Do you want to know what NES game is harder than what game? I can give you an, a super empirical answer right now. Ask of me the question of which game is harder and I will tell you. Ha <laughs> ha. I have, I have ascended to freaking level analysis Valhalla. <laughs> I just I know all the things. You know, if you want a... a there, when we're talking about NES, Gunsmoke or Marble Madness? Gunsmoke's harder. Marble Madness is... shorter. And therefore, it just can't quite be as hard. There's less in it. Marble Madness is learning one skill. Gunsmoke involves multiple skills. Movement, um, shooting vector coordination, uh, working with that auto-scroll, finding the bonuses and stuff. I love Gunsmoke. I think Gunsmoke is a freaking awesome game. Uh, the score can max out in Gunsmoke, actually. It's been done by many. Marble Madness is just too short. If Marble Madness had 15 or 20 levels, it might rival some tougher games, but it's just not. Um, I say if, if there, there's two types of hard NES games in particular. Really, there's two types of hard retro games in general. There's games that are difficult because they are well made, which, uh, for example, I think Battletoads falls into that category. It's difficult intentionally. It's difficult because it was designed to be intentionally so. And then there are games that are difficult because they're janky for some reason. Um, you know, uh, The Adventures of Bayou Billy comes to mind. Everybody loves to talk about Silver Surfer and, and Metroid and uh, Battletoads, but you want a tough NES game? You want something that's going to frustrate you, make you angry, and, and give you that, that NES gamer hard rage? <laughs> Bayou Billy all the way. That game is kind of obnoxious, um, and that's difficult. Because it's kind of obnoxious. Oh, it's a, it's it's a lovably crappy game. Darby and Speed ran it even. It, it it's it's got lovable kind of bad game charm, um, but it is obnoxiously difficult because it is kind of wonkily broken, and uh, that to me is a different type of difficulty. There is intentional and unintentional difficulty. Now, granted, sometimes bad games are also like intentionally designed tough or whatever. But there's like difficulty that arises from the design when you do the design, and then there's difficulty that arises from fighting the design. And in the case of Bayou Billy, you are fighting the mechanics. <laughs> they don't work that well, and you've got to fight them to kind of make them work. Driving a good race car on a challenging track versus driving a janky car with no power steering on a regular road. What is more challenging? Ah, you know, depends what side of the bed you get up on. It did. There were, like, multiple gimmicks that used the zapper in some levels. <sighs> What's the hardest Super Nintendo game, though? I think that's a tougher question. Because the Super Nintendo has games that really take turns in difficulty. How would you compare something like... Um, I, I think Chrono Trigger is a fairly, fairly challenging game. But how do you compare Chrono Trigger and... Um, Contra 3, for example. I think one of the toughest games on NES is probably um, Hagane. I think I, I think uh, Hagane, the Final Conflict, uh, wraps up pretty difficult. Uh, I'm not familiar with Spawn, actually. I can't can't really tell you about that one. Uh, yeah, I guess it's more the comparison. You know, how how do you how do you stack up the difficulty of a game like Chrono Trigger and the difficulty of a game like Hagane, uh, for example, or um, uh, Super Turrican, especially Super Turrican Two. The Turrican series on on SNES was pretty challenging. I'm really thinking though. Unlike the NES era, 
the SNES era sort of backed off on that balls to the wall difficulty approach because they had other ways to make people feel like they got their money's worth, right? You know, an, an NES game needed to be tough because it couldn't have that much content in the first place. So you really had to feel like you got a big experience out of your $60 purchase. Dekudo's so close. But um, NES games on the other hand, or Super Nintendo games on the other hand, had more memory, more graphics, more pretty stuff. And so you could sell a less challenging game on the merits of its, of its graphics. And you see that a lot with the, the SNES and the Genesis era. Blast processing, 16 megabytes of graphics, Donkey Kong Country pre-rendered graphics. Um, so yeah, so games didn't necessarily lean into ridiculous difficulty. They didn't have to anymore. Uh, Lion King definitely ranks up there. Lion King is a game that's hard on purpose because Disney didn't want kids to beat it during the rental period. That's a true story. They told them make the game harder so that people don't beat it in two days when they rent it and then they won't buy it. They wanted you to buy the game, but the problem was that it's so difficult that who wants to buy it? <laughs> you can't beat it. I, as a kid, I was well aware of The Lion King and I did not want to own that game. If my parents were like, what video game do you want for your birthday? I was never going to say Lion King. Why, just because I can't beat it? That's why I want to own it? No, 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 I'm a kid. I want to play something fun. <clears throat> they don't understand, like, really, they, the whole logic with Lion King was so wrong, thinking that, well, if they can't beat it, they're going to be, they're going to want to beat it, that that's what's compelling about it. Now, just make it big. Make it huge and easy. And then kids will want to play it because they can win. And they still want to, you know, they still want to buy it because they want to do it over and over again. Winning the game was never the end of the game for me is, is growing up. And I think for a lot of people growing up, you know, just because you beat the game, I'm, I'm six years old. I have four games. I won Mario. Well, who cares? Because that's all I have to play. So guess what? I'm going to reset and play it some more. <laughs> and it wasn't even boring. It was fun, you know? Yeah, I think Super Ghouls and Ghosts hits that mark. Uh, pretty pretty difficult game. Although, I, I if, if you want difficult ghouls and ghosts, I think the, the NES version takes the cake. Maybe the arcade version, even. If you really want the, the true ghouls and ghosts experience. Arcade ghouls and ghosts is freaking mean. You want tough games, though. Go for the ones that are specifically designed to eat your quarters. Games got too easy? I don't know about that. I think at a certain point we looped back around and now we've got Kaizo again, you know what I mean? Like like the action reaction as games, you know, games got more accessible because games could sell themselves on other things besides the content of their gameplay. It, right? It wasn't necessarily that games got easier. They did get slightly easier. You know, your your average game now is slightly easier, I'd say, than, than an NES game of its time, sure. But they didn't get softer. They just found other ways to sell themselves, you know? If a game, if a game on NES was too easy, it probably wasn't going to sell very well. The challenge kept people engaged. And also, they had less to compare it to, right? If, if the only thing you've ever seen is Atari, like old PCs and arcade games and stuff, then the NES is going to seem like a huge, you know, a big satisfying experience. There's a reason why it got so popular. Yeah, right? The, the, the ease of games, it's given way to complexity. And, and, you know, okay, is, I mean, Dark Souls, Sekiro, are those easy games? You know, there, there's, there's literally a whole Souls category now, specifically for people that want. That kind of thing. We've got I Want to Be the Guy. We've got uh, we've got Tunic. We've got games like Tunic or Scourgebringer. We've got Super Meat Boy for precision platforming. We've got mods. We've got games like Celeste, which are like, you know, it is okay. Is when you know to say I'm I'm just talking about this point. I'm not trying to argue with you or say you're wrong or anything, but you know, to discuss the issue, like, have is Celeste a game an example of a modern game that got too easy? Because Celeste is designed to be a, a, a challenge game. At the same time, 
It also has a lot of modern conveniences, just like the Souls games. They, they're hard, but they have a lot of modern conveniences, modern teaching methods, and just state-of-the-art stuff to help all that challenge go down more smoothly. If you walk up to Defender in the arcade, you pay one quarter, you look at the little info sheet on the on the control panel, and then you haplessly fly your ship around until you crash into something and die, and then that's it. Put in another quarter. You know what I mean? Is that a better hard game than a hard game which lets you play for a little bit more? You know? Is 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 Defender, Robotron 2084 is an absurdly hard game. If we'd like to return to the, the era of well, back when games were legitimately challenging. Yeah, you're right. Robotron is an utterly just brutal and completely unforgiving challenge. It doesn't, you know, I think Robotron in some cases is harder than a boss in Dark Souls. At least a boss in Dark Souls is designed to give you a kind of path and, okay, watch the telegraphing, wait for the opening. Okay, hit him here, but, oh, maybe go in here. Oh, too slow, couldn't get the attack, had to dodge. You know, there, there's, a, there's a give and take. And ro games like Robotron, Defender, really just, like, ratchet that give and take down to where, like, this thing behaves this way. It'll kill you if you don't do this. Oh, you didn't do that? You're dead now. Ha ha ha. And it takes quarters. So, I, I think it's different. Did games get easier? Maybe. But I think our very notion of what an easy game is and what a hard game is, our very notion of difficulty has evolved. And, uh... Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Passing the time along here while these racers are working. First name Butt, Fernap, and Dekudo. Working hard here, man. I, I really do. I appreciate the determination here. I respect that. And I'm going to give every racer on screen 200 cool points just for sticking with it. This is a tough level, and the determination is what makes a great player. And, you know, here's the thing, too. When it comes to difficulty in games, you know, difficulty has always been, back in the days of the arcade, was a... That was how you made your money. You know, video games are an industry. They're here to sell themselves. And, you know, for the most part, they're here to make money doing it. And so in the arcades, the way to get money was to take your quarter in a fair way that made you want to put another quarter in and try again. But the way to sell a game in the home market is accessibility. So maybe games have gotten, air quotes, easier, but that's because of, of market conditions in some cases. Difficult games that you can't win aren't going to sell, fly off the shelves the way an accessible, fun adventure that anyone can pick up and play is. You know, there, there's, there's profitability in the move toward accessibility that we saw in consoles like the Super Nintendo and um, N64, primarily GameCube, you know, and we've seen that evolution into modern day. I think, honestly, if you want a system with a little more difficulty for its era, I think Genesis actually has the more difficult gamer challenges as opposed to Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo of its era was a little more family friendly, a little more PG. And uh, Sega kind of turned and marketed itself more for more experienced players, older teenage players. It had the Mortal Kombat with the blood. Uh, you get a lot of uh, bullet hell games on, uh, sorry, PG, bullet heck games on uh, Genesis than you do on uh, Super Nintendo. And I can off the top of my head think of many more hard Genesis games. I think uh, Kid Chameleon is way harder than Mario. Holy cow. Kid Chameleon's a tough game. Um, get right down to it, especially for the era. Um, uh, Subterranea is a really silly hard game on Genesis. Mean Bean Machine is rough. 
I think that's correct. I think I think Mortal Kombat did run better on Genesis, but I uh, don't know. Shadow of the Beast, good one. Um, Golden Axe is pretty freaking tough. Also, I think Genesis did a bit more with, well, maybe they both did. Experimental styles. Genesis, you get games like uh, Wiz and Liz. Or, or, I don't know, Vector Man. Yeah, yo, hey, let's put some hype in the chat for these racers. We got about 15 minutes to go on the broadcast, and, uh... We are looking at Dekudo in the lower section, uh, going through the final part of the level, Fernap, working on uh, section number three, along with first name Butt. But Dekudo here, so close to the win. Dang, really good gameplay. Dekudo, let's go. Jeez, that's really good, man. Eh? Dekudo with some really solid gameplay here. I like their movement fundamentals. They move cleanly. They articulate themselves well. They're, they're, they're on point. They know where they're going. They're trying to rush ahead a little bit. That's good. They got good fundamentals. It all, it all comes down to fundamentals, you know? It really, really does. To go back to the hockey metaphor, think of Kaizo like hockey. And controlling Mario is like skating on the ice, just ice skating. There's hockey, there's the game of hockey and all its associated meta strategies, things to do. But then there's just ice skating. Ice skating is just the thing you have to do if you just want to play hockey in the first place. If you can't skate, you're not going to play hockey well. And so controlling Mario, jumping, moving, Interacting with objects, boosting uh, jumps off of objects, just doing the fundamentals is a lot like that. You got to be able to skate before you can play the game. And so the better you are at controlling Mario, you know, the better you are at skating. If you skate really, really well, you'll be a stronger hockey player. Kaizo's like hockey. If you're not careful, Something's going to hit you in the face. Oh, jeez. Dekudo. Man. They've had such clean runs. I'm rooting. I'm rooting hard here. Hey, thanks as well for all the uh, for all the follows tonight. If you're having a good time, you can uh, come back every Saturday night, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, don't forget Daylight Savings Change. But uh, 8 o'clock on Saturdays, we have another race every week here. Uh, every week we have a fresh new Kaizo level. Uh, we're about to test next Saturdays soon. Uh, we, you know, we make them, well, we, the makers make them, and we test them during the week, and we race them on Saturdays. So please drop a follow. Come back and see us again if you're having a good time. Just a reminder, you can check out rumhackraces.com if you want to learn more about us, uh, if you want to learn about this level, get the patch for this level, jump on the Discord if you want, and uh, just hang out and talk shop with us. That's cool. I really like games. I like the I like games in general. Wherever you go in in history, in culture, 
Wherever you find humans, you find games too. As far back as you want to go. Um, I had a really good time actually learning about the Royal Game of Ur, one of the uh, the oldest game known to history. Uh, it's an uh, ancient board game. It's actually really cool and complicated, and I've actually wanted to build my own set out of it, out of clay. Uh, but wherever you go in history, far back as you want to take it, there are games. You find toys, little dice, little bones, people playing games. And I love that about us as a species of creature. As humans in general, we love games. We invent games, we play games, we care about games. And I just, I like that. We're a, we're a playful lot, aren't we? I also like to think about the great game players of, of history. Here we are celebrating, you know, famous speedrunners, Kaizo players, sports heroes and stuff. And uh, all throughout history, there have been famous gamers. People who were so skilled that their, their legends lived a hundred years. But now it's so far in the past that we don't even know them anymore. We don't even know what the game they played was. You know, have, have, you, have you ever heard of the Artemis V? He was the greatest blogs ball player the Roman Empire ever saw. You know, we, everyone knew him. He was as famous as Babe Ruth. But, no. <laughs> so close. But I don't know, man. I, just, I think that's fascinating. When you play games, when you sit down and play any sort of game at all, bounce a ball around, play pinball, the, 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 the ancient humanation, humanation? The ancient human fascination, humanation in my own made up language, the ancient human fascination of following a moving object around, of catching and throwing objects, tracking the motion of a swiftly moving orb. We just love orbs. Humans love orbs. Shiny orbs that move around and we chase them. We're kitten kittens in that regard. We love we love shiny orbs. Right? What will what will people think about pinball in 3000 years? It's just just a just an absolutely quaint weird game. Are they going to call video games screen games in the future? You know, when 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 Screens are like holograms. Oh, Grandpa, you play those old screen games? Screens are so old. No one uses screens anymore. Well, it's holograms now. I'm waiting for the day when video games just are a hologram that's in the middle of my room. I want that. I'm, I'm honestly waiting for that day. I want to get a little, like, three-inch tall Mario from Mario Odyssey, and I want him to run around on the stuff in my room. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's the video game I want. I want me and my friends to sit around in the living room and fly holographic Star Fox fighters and like have a little dog fight. Not with VR, but just holograms. I don't want, I think this is, call, call me a, uh, give me that like a gift of prophecy meme. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe. But I have a hunch that eventually VR headsets are going to seem as clunky and obsolete as car phones and and giant brick-sized 80s cell phones well you really put that big silly clunky headset on your head <laughs> jeez now we have holograms now fernap let's go fernap has got it oh man when i was a kid in the very early 90s i must have been four four or five years old early 90s my very rich relative had a car phone. Not as no, it wasn't even a cell phone. It was just a wired phone hooked up in the dashboard of the car. And I called my grandma. I was so thrilled. I was grandma. I'm talking to you on a phone in a car. Isn't that amazing? I like specifically remember this moment because it was just so utterly amazing. It was fascinating. How do you, talking on a phone in a car? Oh, that's oh, the future is here. You know, 
It was, it was it was what a time to be alive. Yeah, right now it's just like don't text message and drive, kids. <laughs> but when you play video games, when you strive for greatness in your particular game, like first name but can they make it striving for greatness? When you strive for greatness like first name but just know that you're a part of a long continuum of gamers throughout history. Humans love, we love hats. We love making hats and just putting them on our head for no reason. Sometimes they serve a purpose. Oftentimes they're just silly and pleasant. We love hats and we love games. Humans love hats and games. In fact, we combine them very often. There are a lot of games that you wear a special hat. Humans just love that. We just love it so much. I think that's cute. I just think it's cute about us. It's just a fun thing we do. I got I got to find some things to like about humanity, you know what I mean? I, we, I really want to hang on to some points we have. I I want to like us. So I try. We do a lot of dumb stuff, but we did invent games and hats, and those are good. Those are good and tend not to hurt anyone. I like the base. I think hat and game combo. I think baseball hats kind of take it because it's literally its type of hat that is named after the thing. Like it's so popular that it's just like that's what it's called. I I, I think that's neat. <gasps> yeah, classic baseball. It was it was such a successful game that its style of hat just became unconnected from the game itself. You don't even have to play baseball to wear a baseball cap. You don't see helmets being called football hats. You just They're called helmets. You wear a football helmet. Yeah, Hatchress too. Mario Odyssey also hat hat focused game. The humans are hat centric. The humans are just a, a hat centric group of of creatures. We we have all sorts, and really we have George Carlin touched on this. We have all sorts of like ceremonies and rules. You know, some religions require you to wear a hat. Other religions require you to not wear a hat. Sometimes you have to take your hat off as a sign of respect. Sometimes you have to leave it on. There's all sorts of little rules and customs and things involving who can wear what hat. And it's, it's a whole big thing, you know. The hats are, are really crucial to, like, <laughs> like, human society, human culture in general. But, yo, everybody. We are winding down the clock for tonight. We schedule two hours for these races. Sometimes we get everybody through, sometimes we don't. But uh, we got all the racers to the final section, which is really great progress. Dekudo is ready to wrap it up. And uh, Fernap and First Name Butter getting close as well. We're going to throw a raid over to one of the racers to wrap it up tonight. Figure, why not go and watch them on their channel? Drop a follow, say hey, uh, cheer them on. But you can drop a follow here and come back and see us again on Saturday next for another exciting ROM hack race. If you want to learn more, once again, the website is there for you. Download the patch, check it all out, 
Uh, sign up, volunteer, or uh, just race if you want to. Uh, play it off stream if you want. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Again, thank you so much to the testers tonight, to the scouts doing excellent work. Osu on the restream. Dr. No helping us out. Kelgan D4 running the bot. And uh, everybody just for being here and being yourselves. Oh, and I guess for me for doing commentary. Thanks for hanging out. We're going to go raid first name butt tonight. You matter. Your thoughts matter. Your heart matters. Your feelings matter. You matter to other people in your lives. You matter to me as human beings. You matter to the internet's number one long boy for it. And the people that matter to you in your lives would love to hear from you about that. We know black lives matter, LGBTQIA plus lives matter, indigenous lives matter, disabled lives matter, you too. We'll see you all again real soon. Uh, for my friends, I will see you all again on my stream tomorrow night. I will be there. I've been taking some time off to just be a regular person, get my KLDC write-ups done, but I am done with that now. So I will see you all tomorrow. Thanks for hanging out. Make some friends in the Kaizo community, and I'll catch you next time. Peace.